Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings from bygone books. Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings by Gary and Ruth from the classic books of Celtic lore and study. Book 1, Chapter 10 of British Goblins. Welsh folklore, fairy mythology, legends and traditions. Chapter 10 Fairy money and fairy gifts in general, including the story of Gitto Bach or Little Griffith, the penalty of blabbing, legends of the shepherds of Cumhlan, the money value of kindness, Ianto Llywellyn and the Tulwith Teg, the legend of Havard Llywyddog, and lessons inculcated by these superstitions. Section 1 This is fairy gold, boy, and twill prove so, says the old shepherd in Winter's Tale, sagely adding, Up with it, keep it close, home, home the next way. We're lucky, boy, and to be so still requires nothing but secrecy. Winter's Tale, Act 3, Scene 3 Here we have the traditional belief of the Welsh peasantry in a nutshell. Fairy money is as good as any, so long as its source is kept a profound secret. If the finder relate the particulars of his good fortune, it will vanish. Sometimes, especially in cases where the money has been spent, the evil result of a tattling consists in there being no further favours of the sort. The same law governs fairy gifts of all kinds. A Breckenshire legend tells of the generosity of the Tilwith Teg in presenting the peasantry with loaves of bread, which turned to toadstools next morning. It was necessary to eat the bread in darkness and silence to avoid this transformation. The story of Gito Bach, a familiar one in Wales, is a picturesque example. Gito Bach, little Griffith, a good little farmer's boy of Glamorganshire, used often to ramble to the top of the mountain to look after his father's sheep. On his return, he would show his brothers and sisters pieces of a remarkably white paper, like crown pieces with letters stamped upon them which he said were given to him by the little children with whom he played on the mountain. One day he did not return. For two years nothing was heard of him. Meantime other children occasionally got like crown pieces of paper from the mountains. One morning when Gito's mother opened the door, there he sat, the truant, dressed exactly as he was when she saw him last, two years ago. He had a little bundle under his arm. "'Where in the world have you been all this time?' asked his mother. "'Why, it was only yesterday I went away,' quoth Gito. "'Look at the pretty clothes the children gave me on the mountain, "'for dancing with them to the music of their harps.' "'And with this he opened his bundle and showed a handsome dress, "'and behold, it was only paper, like the fairy money.'" Section 2 But usually throughout Wales... It is simply a discontinuance of a fairy favour which follows blabbing. A legend is connected with the bridge in Anglesey of a lad who often saw the fairies there and profited by their generosity. Every morning while going to fetch his father's cows from pasture, he saw them, and after they were gone he always found a groat on a certain stone of Caminod Bridge. The boys having money so often about him excited his father's suspicion and one Sabbath day he cross-questioned the lad as to the manner in which it was obtained. Oh, the meddlesomeness of fathers. Of course, the poor boy confessed that it was through the medium of the fairies. And, of course, though he often went after this to the field, he never found any money on the bridge, nor saw the offended Dulwith Teg again. Through his divulging the secret, their favour was lost. Jones tells a similar story of a young woman named Anne William Francis, in the parish of Basachleg, who on going by night into a little grove of wood near the house heard pleasant music and saw a company of fairies dancing on the grass. She took a pail of water there, thinking it would gratify them. 
The next time she went there, she had a shilling given her. And so had for several nights after, until she had twenty-one shillings. But her mother happened to find the money, questioned her as to where she got it, fearing that she had stolen it. At first the girl would not tell, but when her mother went very severe on her and threatened to beat her, she confessed she got the money from the fairies. After that, they never gave her any more. The prophet adds, I have heard of other places where people have had money from the fairies, sometimes silver sixpences, but most commonly copper coin. As they cannot make money, it certainly must be money lost or concealed by persons. The euphemism of this is hardly like the wonder-loving Jones. Section 3 in the legends of the two shepherds of Cumhlan and their experience with the fairies, the first deals with the secrecy feature, while the second reproduces the often impressed lesson concerning the money value of kindness. The first is as follows. One evening a shepherd, who had been searching for his sheep on the side of Nanda Betus, after crossing Bulch Cumhlan, espied a number of little people singing and dancing and some of the prettiest damsels he ever set eyes on preparing a feast. He went to them and partook of the meal, and thought he had never tasted anything to equal those dishes. When it became dusk, they pitched their tents, and the shepherds had never seen before such beautiful things as they had about them there. They provided him with a soft feather bed and sheets of the finest linen, and he retired, feeling like a prince. But on the morrow... Lo and behold, his bed was but a bush of bulrushes, and his pillow a tuft of moss. He, however, found in his shoes some pieces of silver, and afterwards, for a long time, he continued to find once a week a piece of silver placed between two stones near the spot where he had lain. And one day he divulged his secret to another, and the weekly coin was never placed there again. There was another shepherd near Kumshan, who heard some strange noises in a crevice of a rock, and turning to see what it was, found there a singular creature who wept bitterly. He took it out and saw it to be a fairy child, and whilst he was looking at it compassionately, two middle-aged men came to him and thanked him courteously for his kindness, and on leaving him, presented him with a staff as a token of remembrance of the occasion. The following year, every sheep he possessed bore two ewe lambs. They continued to thus breed for years to come. But one very dark and stormy night, having stayed very late in the village, in crossing the river that comes down from Kumchlan, there being a great flood sweeping everything before it, he dropped his staff into the river and saw it no more. On the morrow he found that nearly all his sheep and lambs, like his staff, had been swept away by the flood. His wealth had departed from him in the same way as it came, with the staff which he had received from the guardians of the fairy child. Section 4 A Pembrokeshire Welshman told me this story as a tradition well known in that part of Wales. Yanto Llewellyn was a man who lived in the parish of Llanvahungel, not more than fifty or eighty years ago, and who had precious good reason to believe in the fairies. He used to keep his fire of coal balls burning all night long, out of pure kindness of heart, in case the Tolwith Teg should be cold. That they came into his kitchen every night he was well aware. He often heard them. One night when they were there as usual, Yanto was lying wide awake and heard them say, I wish we had some good bread and cheese this cold night, but the poor man has only a morsel left, and though it's true that would be a good meal for us, it is but a mouthful to him, and he might starve if we took it. At this, Yanto cried out at the top of his voice, Take anything I've got in my cupboard and welcome to you. And then he turned over and went to sleep. The next morning, when he descended into the kitchen, he looked in his cupboard to see if by good luck there might be a bit of crust there. He had no sooner opened the cupboard door than he cried out, Or Anwil, what's this? for there stood the finest cheese he had ever seen in his life, with two loaves of bread on top of it. Look there, Ritty, waving his hand towards the wood where he knew the fairies lived. 
Good luck to you. May you never be hungry or penniless. And he had not got the words out of his mouth when he saw, what do you think, a shilling on the hob. But that was the lucky shilling. Every morning after this, when Yanto got up, there was the shilling on the hob. Another one, you mind, for he'd spent the first for beer and tobacco to go with his bread and cheese. Well, after that, no man in the parish was better supplied with money than Yanto Llewellyn, though he never did a stroke of work. He had enough to keep his wife in ease and comfort too, and he got the name of Lucky Yanto. And lucky he might have been to the day of his death, but for the curiosity of woman. Betsy, his wife, was determined to know where all this money came from, and gave the poor man no peace. Well, now oofed, she cried, which means in English, nine shames on you. To have a bad secret from your own dear wife. But you know, Betsy, if I tell you, I'll never get any more money. Ah, said she, then it's the fairies. Drato, said he, and that means bother it all. Yes, the fairies it is. With that, he thrust his hands down in his breeches' pockets in a sullen manner and left the house. He had had seven shillings in his pockets up to that minute, and he went feeling for them with his fingers and found they were gone. In place of them were some pieces of paper fit only to light his pipe. And from that day, the fairies bought him no more money. Section 5 The lesson of generosity is taught with force and simplicity in the legend of Havod Llwyddog, and the necessity for secrecy is quite abandoned. Again, it is a shepherd who dwelt at Cumdully, and who went every summer to live in a cabin by the green lake, Llyn Glass, along with his fold. One morning on awakening from sleep, he saw a good-looking damsel dressing an infant close by his side. She had very little in which to wrap the babe, so he threw her an old shirt of his own and bade her place it about the child. She thanked him and departed. Every night thereafter, the shepherd found a piece of silver placed in an old clog in his cabin. Years and years as good luck continued, and Merig the shepherd became immensely wealthy. He married a lovely girl and went to the Havod Luithog to live. Whatever he undertook prospered, Hence the name Havod Luithog, for Luiz means prosperity. The fairies paid nightly visits to the Havod. No witch or evil spirit could harm this people, as Bendi the Mamai was poured down upon the family and all their descendants. Section 6 The thought will naturally occur that by fostering belief in such tales, as some of the foregoing, roguery might make the superstition useful in silencing inquiry as to ill-gotten gains. But on the other hand, the virtues of hospitality and generosity were no doubt fostered by the same influences. If anyone was favoured by the fairies in this manner, the immediate explanation was that he had done a good turn to them, generally without suspecting who they were. The virtues of neatness in young girls and servants were encouraged by the like notions. The belief that a fairy will leave money only on a clean-kept hob could tend to nothing more directly. It was also made a condition of pleasing the Tullworth Teg that the hearth should be carefully swept and the pails left full of water. Then the fairies would come at midnight, continue their revels till daybreak, sing the well-known strain of Toriadides, or the dawn, leave a piece of money on the hob, and disappear. Here is seen a precaution against fire in the clean-swept hearth and the provision of filled water pails. That the promised reward did not always arrive was not evidence it would never arrive, so the virtue of perseverance was also fostered. Superstitions of this class are widely prevalent among Aryan peoples. The Arabian Nights story of an old rogue whose money turned to leaves will be recalled. In Danish folklore, the fairy money bestowed on the boars turns sometimes to pebbles and sometimes grow hot and burns their fingers so that they drop it when it sinks into the earth. Book 1, Chapter 10 of British Goblins Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions a link to the full text can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com.
That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. You can also find all of the names, place names, and other non-English words written down for you in the show notes in the order in which they appear in this reading. If you'd like to comment on this chapter, pop over to our show notes and join in or start a conversation. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not try our sister podcast, The Celtic Myth Pod Show, which brings the stories of ancient Celts to life with narrative and drama, as well as bringing you modern Celtic music, stories and information. Find The Celtic Myth Pod Show in all the places where the best podcasts hang out or on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. You've been listening to Celtic Tomes, read by Gary and Ruth. Our theme music is Gander in the Pretty Hole by Slauncher, and a link to their music can be found in the show notes at CelticTomes.Libsyn.com. This podcast has been produced by The Celtic Myth Show. Music